Remember when the T-Rex took over San Diego? How about the iconic last words of Robert Muldoon? Get your remote handy because these are the most paused moments in the Jurassic Park franchise. As popular and successful as the theme park in Jurassic World is, before all the dinosaurs get loose at least, it's not exactly what John Hammond originally had in mind. Whereas the first iteration of Jurassic Park was basically a prehistoric zoo, Jurassic World is a full-fledged amusement park with all the bells, whistles, and merchandise tie-ins one might expect. Much like Main Street USA at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, Jurassic World has its own Main Street with real-world franchise locations. There's a Ben & Jerry's ice cream shop, a Dave & Buster's arcade, and enough shopping outlets to qualify as a mall. One notable restaurant you might have spotted is Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville, the tropical, casual dining experience based off of the namesake singer's hit song. What you may not have noticed, however, is a cameo from the Cheeseburger in Paradise singer himself. During the sequence in which the Pteranodons are terrorizing everyone in sight, Buffett has his priorities in order, making a valiant effort to protect his margaritas as everyone else runs for dear life. According to Yahoo, Buffett's cameo appearance was a result of his longtime friendship with Jurassic World producer Frank Marshall. Buffett and his Coral Reefer band even performed some of their signature jams with Marshall and Chris Pratt at the Jurassic World premiere after party. Although these moments aren't in any particular order, it's only appropriate that this one comes in the number two spot. Dr. Alan Grant, Dr. Ian Malcolm, Tim Murphy, Lex Murphy, and Donald Gennaro are returning in the automated Ford Explorers as Dennis Nedry makes his big escape to the docks. It's nighttime, it's raining, and their SUVs just so happen to be passing by the Tyrannosaurus paddock when Nedry's program executes, shutting down power to the vehicles and the high-voltage security fences, meant to keep the dinosaurs and guests from mingling. Suddenly, that goat the control room used to goad the T-Rex out with earlier stops bleeding. We see that iconic shot of the rippling water glasses, courtesy of the gargantuan steps of the prehistoric tyrant, the T-Rex's steps. What's remaining from the goat carcass drops on the vehicle and a cowardly Donald makes a run for the bathroom, leaving the kids behind. He left us. He left us. The Tyrannosaurus breaks containment, as they tend to do, and goes after the last thing it saw moving. Luckily, Alan gets her attention with a road flare and Ian follows suit, giving the former a chance to rescue the kids. When the T-Rex chases Ian into the bathroom, it completely falls apart, leaving only poor Donald sitting there atop a toilet, seconds away from being snapped up in her jaws. If you look closely, you'll see that the lawyer was still wearing his pants and was only using the bathroom for cover, much to everyone's relief. Except Donald's, that is. There are few things dumber than choosing to travel to the dinosaur-infested island of Isla Sorna, and one of them is snatching up an infant Tyrannosaurus Rex and trying to treat it like a wounded puppy. Well, in the Lost World Jurassic Park, animal behavior scientist Dr. Sarah Harding and photographer Nick Van Owen do both. After the team releases several captive dinos to wreak havoc on the InGen base camp, Nick nabs a baby T-Rex with a broken leg and convinces Sarah to help him bring it to their mobile lab for treatment. They tend to its wounds despite Ian's protests and predictably find themselves face to face with two very concerned parents. Mommy's very angry. The team tries to appease the angry couple by returning their baby, but it's too little too late. The two combine their efforts to push the RV off a cliff, leaving Ian, Sarah, and Nick hanging. The three eventually make it back alive thanks to Eddie's noble sacrifice and InGen's convenient timing, but not before a nearly 10 minute long sequence full of intense, death-defying moments. If you're crazy enough to agree to disable Jurassic Park's security systems in order to steal fertilized dinosaur embryos from their labs, there's a good chance you might not make it back home alive. Such is the case with Dennis Nedry, the bumbling antagonist of the series' first entry. After retrieving that precious dino DNA, Dennis makes his not-so-great escape in the pouring rain only to lose his way and crash his jeep into the mud. He tries to use a metal cable to free the car, but ends up taking a tumble down a hill and losing his glasses in the process. Once he gains his bearings, he finds himself face-to-face -face with a not-so-friendly Dilophosaurus. Rather than run, Dennis tries to bargain with the creature, eventually throwing a stick for it to fetch like a dog. And no wonder you're extinct! I'm gonna run you over when I come back down. Unlike a dog, however, the Dilophosaurus opens her neck frill and spits venom in Dennis's face before finally killing him. 
While the Dilophosaurus wasn't exactly able to spit such sticky venom in real life, the scene makes for one of the highlights of the first film and a satisfying bit of comeuppance for such a loathsome villain. When lovable scamps Zack and Gray Mitchell get the chance to ditch their chaperone Zara and finally get the chance to see something cool, it takes Jurassic World's Mosasaurus, a giant aquatic reptile from the late Cretaceous period, to get their attention. The boys head to an enclosure reminiscent of the orca attractions at SeaWorld, only this time, instead of a wetsuit-clad trainer feeding Shamu a fish by hand, they're feeding a massive, once-extinct creature an entire great white shark with a crane. The Mosasaurus gobbles up the shark in a single bite, drenching Zack, Gray, and everyone else sitting in the splash zone. Feeding the modern ocean's alpha predator to the Mosasaurus like a sardine straight out of a can is meant to demonstrate its sheer size and strength, beyond just making it look big with special effects. It's also a nod to one of the creative minds that launched the Jurassic Park franchise, director Steven Spielberg who helmed Jurassic Park and The Lost World, and rose to fame after directing the shark thriller Jaws. The shark being fed to the Mosasaurus happens to be trussed up similarly to the falsely accused tiger shark that was very much not the source of the town's problems in the first Jaws films. The Mosasaurus makes another appearance to Zack and Gray later on, albeit under less entertaining circumstances, when the beast makes dessert out of Zara and some pteranodons. So much for adult supervision. Under the direction of John Hammond's usurping nephew Peter Ludlow, InGen's big plan in The Lost World is to capture a bunch of the dinosaurs on Isla Sorna and bring them to a facility in San Diego for public exhibition. Naturally, everything works out perfectly, no one is hurt, and they all go on to live happy and fulfilling lives. Except not. Things go wrong and people are hurt. After managing to capture the male Tyrannosaurus and load him onto a cargo ship, InGen sets about sailing back to the mainland with the dinosaur in tow. Unfortunately, things don't go wrong soon enough, as the ship carrying Papa T-Rex actually manages to make it all the way to port before promptly crashing and releasing him from his cage. What follows is carnage on a level Mother Nature never intended. The entire ending sequence of The Lost World defies belief for more than one reason. Not only is an angry dinosaur rampaging through a major urban center, but younger viewers might find it preposterous that gas was ever $1.15 for regular 87 octane unleaded. Speaking of the T-Rex's tear through San Diego, one moment during the chaotic climax of The Lost World sees the carnivore chase a city bus into a blockbuster video. Remember Blockbuster? That place where people used to rent movies back when they had to be manually rewound? Anyway, when Bus 967 takes a cue from Netflix and puts Blockbuster out of business, a quick click of the pause button reveals a few posters for the movies you might not be able to check out in real life. There's a Jack and the Beanstalks starring Robin Williams, a reference to Francis Ford Coppola's Jack, a film in which Williams portrayed a 10-year-old child with a rapid aging disorder. If you're a surfing fan, don't miss Tsunami Sunrise, which looks like what would happen if Tom Hanks starred in Point Break. Finally, for the English teachers in the audience, there's an adaptation of Shakespeare's classic tragedy, King Lear, starring none other than the Terminator himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's just a shame that none of the blockbuster customers got to enjoy their movie night. You know, on account of the rampaging dinosaur. The climactic final showdown right before the end of the first Jurassic Park movie takes place in the park's visitor center. As Tim and Lex sit down to dinner, having finally returned to safety by Alan, Lex starts shaking so hard her lime jello nearly falls off her spoon. She sees the shadow of a velociraptor on the wall behind her brother, and the two take refuge in the kitchen, with the raptors in pursuit. After they manage to trap one in the walk-in cooler, they reunite with Dr. Alan Grant and Dr. Ellie Sadler before heading for the control room. Just because the security system is rebooted and the doors are locked, it doesn't mean a velociraptor is going to give up, however. Raptor crashes through the window and follows them through the ventilation system to the lobby, and after a quick struggle, all four humans and the dinosaur find themselves dangling from a skeleton suspended from the ceiling. After everyone comes crashing down, it looks like the end for our brave heroes. Things are looking bleak, with one raptor about to pounce, but the T-Rex shows up and snatches the much smaller dino up in its jaws. The humans look on in amazement as they realize their lives have just been saved by the same massive carnivore that had terrorized them so recently. Alan and company beat feet as the second raptor retaliates, but it's no match for the Tyrannosaurus. Having established dominance, the T-Rex does what comes naturally. It roars a mighty roar, knocking the banner loose and giving us the picture-perfect shot. 
At the onset of Jurassic Park 3, Dr. Alan Grant is in desperate need of funding to continue his research on velociraptors. Against his better judgment, he agrees to give a rich couple and their shady associates an aerial tour of Isla Sorna, only to find himself shanghaied into what was actually a rescue mission all along. Here we go again. The third installment in the original Jurassic Park trilogy introduces viewers to one of many challengers to the Tyrannosaurus Rex's throne, the Spinosaurus. When Alan wakes up from his involuntary nap, courtesy of armed Thug Cooper, he finds that not only has the plane landed, but his fellow passengers have made enough noise to lead the fearsome predator directly to them. Karma quickly comes for Cooper as he's left behind when the group scrambles to get back on the plane. As they're about to take off, a Spinosaurus jumps out and devours Cooper, damaging the plane in the process and forcing a crash landing. Just when they think they've escaped, they find themselves face to face with the Tyrannosaurus, who engages the Spinosaurus in a battle to the death. The group is forced to watch as survival of the fittest plays out right in front of them. Spinosaurus 1, T-Rex 0. In Jurassic Park, having not heard from Alan, Tim, and Lex, the remaining survivors work on getting the park systems back online. Chief Engineer Ray Arnold sets about rebooting every device on the island, but has to head to a maintenance shed to complete the process. When he doesn't return, Dr. Ellie Sattler and Game Warden Robert Muldoon head out to assess the situation. Unfortunately, they find the rebooting process has released the Velociraptors from their nearby enclosure. Their solution is simple. Robert will distract the Velociraptors, who are pack hunters by nature, while Ellie turns the power back on. The only problem? One of the raptors peels off after Ellie, leaving two for Robert to handle. Ellie is attacked by the third raptor after flipping the switch, but manages to hobble her way back out to the jeep. Robert, meanwhile, is tracking one of the raptors, shotgun in hand. But as Alan warned earlier in the film, the attack doesn't come from ahead, it comes from the side. As Robert stalks one of the velociraptors, the other one flanks him and prepares for an ambush. Thinking he's outsmarted the raptor he's after by using his hat as a decoy, Robert eventually realizes he's the one who's fallen into a trap. Then come those famous last words. Clever girl. Much like The Lost World, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom centers on capturing dinosaurs running wild on an island. This time, Owen Grady and Claire Deering head to the ruins of the once prosperous Jurassic World in an attempt to save the dinosaurs there from an active volcano that threatens re-extinction. Despite being assured by Ellie Mills, the assistant to John Hammond's former partner Sir Benjamin Lockwood, that the dinos would be transferred to a new island sanctuary, Mills secretly intends to auction each one off to the highest bidder. However, as usual, things don't go as planned for the bad guys. Despite being left for dead, Owen and Claire survive, stowing away on the transport ship. When they're discovered at the Lockwood estate, they escape captivity with the help of a hard-headed Pachycephalosaurus, which Owen sets loose in the auction chamber while the crown jewel, the Indoraptor, is on display. Everything goes bananas, and the caged dinosaurs are about to be killed by poison gas, leaving Owen and Claire with the terrible choice of letting them die or releasing them to go roam the United States. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, Macy, the clone of Lockwood's deceased daughter, makes the decision for them, setting the animals free and quite possibly dooming the West Coast to annihilation by dinosaurs. In the movie's denouement montage, as Dr. Ian Malcolm testifies before Congress, we see a Tyrannosaurus Rex approach a zoo and have an intense stare down with a lion, with the animals showing off their mightiest roars to each other. Unfortunately for the lion, though, this doesn't exactly seem like an even matchup. At the climax of Jurassic World, Owen Grady has managed to reconnect with Blue and the other Velociraptors, re-establishing himself as the Alpha of the pack. When the Indominus Rex comes along and figures out what's up, she is not happy and attacks Blue. If the loyalty of the remaining Velociraptors was ever in doubt, the Indominus attacking one of their own makes the sides very clear. Owen sicks them on the Indominus and tries to lead Claire, Zack, and Grey to safety, but the larger dinosaur outmatches the two raptors. Gray says they need more teeth, which gives Claire the insane, yet ultimately brilliant idea to add the Tyrannosaurus Rex into the mix. Against his better judgment, Lowry Crothers, the last employee left in the control room, releases the T-Rex, and Claire leads it into battle with flares, mirroring the iconic T-Rex attack scene from the original Jurassic Park. The Indominus is getting the better of the Tyrannosaurus until Blue gains a second wind and re-enters the fray, fighting alongside the T-Rex. As the tide turns, the battle shifts away from the visitor center and the Indominus finds itself backed up against the edge of the lagoon. Unwilling to yield any more ground, it lets out a massive roar, which the T-Rex and Blue echo. Then Player 4 enters the game. 
The Mosasaurus lunges out of the lagoon, grabs the Indominus by the throat in its massive jaws, and drags it down underwater. More teeth indeed. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.